with a little technical difficulties, but we're back live from the Fury Riverfront Museum. I'm John Morris, the director, on behalf of all of us at the museum. We're here live on this cold January Saturday, what would have been the last weekend of guitar, the instrument that rocked the world, an extraordinary first time ever in Illinois exhibition that uh, we were fortunate to have opened to the public for about seven weeks, and then since November 18th, uh, due to COVID, we've had to close it down. So um, I'm live in the lobby, and I'm about to take you inside for a special last look and to meet some surprise uh, personalities, including Brian Ray, the treasurer of our board, and the regional president of PNC Bank, one of our great co-sponsors of this exhibition, and a special drawing with Greg and Karen Geronis, Greg, a board member here, uh, and, and his firm, uh, along with Karen, underwrote a special uh, uh, drawing for a flying V guitar. So that will be drawn toward the end of this live stream, so stay with us. We'll meet some other guests as we go along the way with Bill Conger and Zach Zetterberg, our curators. Behind me here, and let's just take a look at this. It's something you don't often get to see, but in the lobby, and you can look out across and back here in the lobby, uh, are the crates uh, in which this exhibition will be on its way to Omaha, Nebraska, its next venue. We're the 28th venue in, in 10 years, first one in Illinois for this extraordinary guitar exhibition. But uh, without further introduction, on behalf of our board of directors, our staff here, we wish you a happy new year. We thank you for joining us today. Let's go inside and take a look at guitar. I'm gonna mask up as we all do these days and uh, be safe out there. Thanks, thanks for joining us, let's go inside. And as we go inside, I want to show you one more thing. Here's the entrance, which you all recognize to our great museum. Over here on this glass are people I always stop to recognize because without them, there would be no way we could bring this exhibition in. The first to step forward was Illinois Mutual. More than a year and a half ago, Illinois Mutual said, let's bring this in. PNC, one of our leading corporate visionary city council members, and OSF and Unity Point Corporate Visionary Society Council members, and uh, our Rudy King Warner Trust and other sponsors. We really appreciate all they do for us uh, here at the museum. So let's go in and let's see guitar, the instrument that rocked the world. So we're going to start inside by looking out over this magnificent exhibition, but I have a very special guest to introduce you to, Brian Ray, Regional President of PNC Bank, the treasurer of our board, and, uh, and Brian stepped forward to help us bring this exhibition, but also has some special enthusiasm for a guitar and the instrument that rocked the world. Brian Ray, thanks for coming out this morning on a Saturday morning. Absolutely. Well, thank you for everybody who's joining us for this virtual tour today. It's been a very interesting uh, time and year, and it's been difficult for many people to come to the museum and to feel safe doing so. So we wanted to give you just one more option uh, as, uh, as the board of directors to allow you to experience this amazing exhibit. And whether your flavor is Jimmy Page, or whether it's Chrissy Hine, or Slash, or Eddie Van Halen, we've got a little bit of everything for you here today. So. From the board of directors of the museum, thank you so much for all the time and the dollars that you invest in us, and we hope that you really enjoy this little tour we're going to provide for you today. Great. Thank you, Brian. And before we say uh, adieu to Brian this morning, we're going to start the tour by having Brian show us some, somebody in this exhibition with a very special connection to him personally. Brian is as much a resident of Central Illinois and Peoria as, as anybody I've ever known, but he is originally from Akron, Ohio, and it happens that there's a special connection right beyond the Guinness Book of World Records' largest flying V guitar, playable guitar. Let's head down here and, and revisit a native daughter of Akron, Ohio. So this is... This is Brian Ray as a special connection. I'm going to let you tell him about it. Bring the camera in so we can see a little closer. Sure. So as John mentioned, I'm from Akron, Ohio, and uh, that's where I was before I moved to Central Illinois and had the pleasure to be uh, a resident here. But uh, one of the alum from my high school in Akron, Ohio, is Chrissy Hind. Uh, many of you probably know that Chrissy Hind uh, was with the Pretenders, who have had an amazing music career. So it's, it was a real honor for me 
when we had this uh, exhibit comes to Fiore Riverfront Museum to see Chrissy Hind as one of the featured guitarists. So thank you so much for that, John. There you go, Brian Ray. Thank you very much, Brian. So let's, Brian, let's walk back to the front, but as we do, uh, Hannah, let's take a look at this incredible flying V, the Guinness Book of World's Records, largest playable guitar. Uh, and uh, we're have, so pleased to have had it here at, at the Peoria River Front Museum for these last weeks. So let's head down here, Hannah, and uh, introduce everybody to the chief curator of the Peoria River Front Museum. This is Bill Conger. And Bill Conger and his team have worked so hard to bring all of these exhibitions that we have to the museum, and they're going to take some time to give you an overview today. So, Bill Conger. Thank you, John. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. What an amazing moment for us, bringing this exhibition guitar, the instrument that rocked the world, from the National Guitar Museum in New York City. And their curator, H.P. Newquist, uh, masterfully assembled over 60 of the most radical, inspirational, expressive guitars uh, for this exhibition, along with some of the science behind the electric uh, uh, component of electric guitars, uh, as well as the earliest components of uh, some of the kind of the early uh, benefactors of what would become the guitar. Uh, we have in this show, of course, as John mentioned, the 43 and a half foot uh, Guinness Book of World Records largest playable guitar, the uh, replica of the Flying V, the Gibson Flying V. And it's a perfect moment to mention that the guitar in this exhibition is so successful because the guitar is the most expressive instrument. It allowed every player of that instrument to really mold uh, the instrument and make it their own and give it a flair and a kind of twist uh, to the guitar that became part of that person's individuality. So there is so much to explore in this show. We're gonna do a real uh, quick job of it, but we're gonna hit a lot of points. And to kick us off is our curator of art and a guitarist himself, uh, Mr. Zach Zetterberg. So I will hand it off to Zach and I will meet up with you in a few minutes. Sounds great, thanks Bill. Hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm gonna quickly uh, go through the front of the gallery here, which is actually uh, a section of more modern guitars. A lot of guitar, guitars that um, deal with innovating the original idea of what the guitar was. And so I'm gonna walk you through here, and we're gonna go take a look at sort of where the, the, the guitar began, how it became electrified, and then we're going to talk about some of the more uh, iconic electric guitars. So take a quick, uh, let's go for a quick walk through here. I might point out a few things here. One thing that's really interesting right at the front of the show is, is this guitar actually has a, a uh, LCD screen in it that when the, when the player is performing, it will actually show the audience that the player is looking at in the, through the guitar. Very innovative. So let's go back here. As Bill said, there are over 60 guitars. I would say over 30 of those are, are uh, very modern electric guitars. What I'm about to show you is a early Gibson guitar. And Gibson and Martin were two of the earliest instruments in America. Uh, let's take a, a close look here at this Gibson L1 flat top. So this is, I think, probably what most of us would recognize as a um, as your typical acoustic guitar. And it definitely is, um, is this is an iconic shape. Uh, very early, this, I believe this guitar was made around the 20s or 30s. But this is sort of where the guitar started when steel strings were attached to the instrument. And because of that, um, the guitar had to be built a different way. So 
we're all familiar with the outside of the guitar, but with the, the uh, with this show, we've got some insight into the inside. So let's let's take a quick look at actually what the inside of a guitar would look like. And you can see that there's a complex uh, bracing system. And this has to be built like this so that the guitar does not cave in. The, uh, the steel strings on a guitar put a lot of pressure on the instrument. And this bracing inside is what keeps it from uh, it, it from caving in. So from the acoustic, uh, you know, it had limitations. It's not a very loud instrument. During the 30s, big bands started coming onto the scene. A lot of horns, a lot of loud sound. The guitar was basically a rhythmic instrument, meaning it was just kind of chunking out chords. It was not very melodic. So they had to come up with a way to make it louder. So let's walk over to the first electric guitar ever invented. And this, this does not look like your modern electric guitar, but this is the Rickenbacker frying pan. And I think it's probably one of the most important guitars in the show in that it was the first electric guitar ever invented by George Beecham. And Beecham actually started Rickenbacker guitars. And I, I believe they made less than a hundred of these. They were um, originally started for Hawaiian music. And this guitar would not be played like your typical modern day electric guitar. This would actually be played as like a lap steel guitar with a slide and you play it more like this. So it's very interesting. This is, here's the pickup here, and that's where the sound comes through and would go into the amplifier. And so it's a really, um, a, a really iconic guitar. I don't think um, your everyday person who plays guitar might know about this. So with that said, I want to show you the next evolution in this is combining the technology of the pickup with the Spanish style uh, acoustic guitar that we just looked at. So let's go uh, talk to some local musicians about this great uh, guitar. It's actually called Lucille, you may know it. But let's, let's take a quick walk and we'll go take a look at Lucille. So we've got with us today Roy Ponce and Jake Schultz from the uh, local band Bra Brainchild. And we're going to take a look at this uh, Gibson ES355. And this is a kind of guitar that was played by B.B. King. And uh, if you're wondering what ES means, that means electric Spanish. So this is when the idea of the electric guitar and the pickup system came together with the Spanish style acoustic guitar to make sort of an acoustic electric guitar. So what do you guys, what is your initial response when you see this? This guitar right here is uh, pretty much what all guitarists want, but we <laughs> can't afford, but this one is just iconic because BB King played it. It's got the smooth sound because of these, uh, these humbucker pickups right here. There's two pickups inside there, so uh, they get a fatter sound, sweeter sound, and this whole big body creates a better tone for the guitar, you know. And I think inside, on some of these, they're semi-hollow inside there, so there's chambers inside there that lets it resonate the sound. They just have really sweet, sweet sound to it. Like uh, normally nowadays, jazz guys play because it, it has a good clean sound to it. But you can have you can put on pedals and rock out to it too. It sounds great. Right. What do you like about it? Huh? Yeah, we started out with Strat, um, then I got a an Epiphone dot, which is similar style to Epiphone's actually got like a lower brand of Gibson, and I, I was just kind of hooked because of the versatile. Yeah, yours is almost just like that. Yeah. Yeah, it looks a lot like it, but you can cover just so many different yeah. range of sounds and styles. So you guys play like a fusion 
Yeah. So we play clean and dirty. So this type of guitar, we play those type of guitars. He almost has one exactly like that. But um, it's just better to have a cleaner sound first, and then you, you go from there. This thing just does it for you. And then there's a there's that Strat in there, which is like the opposite of this. It has the single coils in it, just one of these pickups. So now. You have you can you know switch it up and have different sounds. Funky what does, sounds. What does a single coil? It has sound like it's thinner to... sound. It's okay. like a thinner kind of like treblier sound. This one's a more fatter, bassier sound. Uh, so when you hear like when you hear Jimi Hendrix, it's the Strat. It has a thinner uh, wah wah up high sound, and then this one has more of a sweeter lower uh, full out full sound. And this exhibit is the best, you guys. <laughs> and I, it's it's not, it, you know, it's unfortunate we can't all be here all the time and check it out as much as we can. But this is a good, uh, you know, substitute the video, you know. Absolutely. But this is awesome that they had it this year, and we're so stoked to be a part of it. And, Thank you, guys. And everybody watching should know that through the run of this exhibit, we've been doing live performances in the gallery. Plus, we've done some tours and some talks with uh, guitar uh, experts. And all of that is in, on our YouTube channel, so if you're interested in more after this, there's plenty to watch on YouTube. So thank you guys. Thank you. Check out Brainchild, and make sure you uh, continue to follow this great local band. You guys have been around yeah, for forever. So years years now. Now. <laughs> yeah. so they're an incredibly fun band, and these two guys are probably two of the, the, the most uh, Accomplished guitar player. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. In Central Illinois. So it, thank you for yeah, being here. You guys, that's an honor. Thank you. You're welcome. And enjoy the rest of the tour because this place is awesome. We're going to go take a, uh, a walk back, and Bill Tiger is going to talk to us about some of the most iconic guitars that you will probably recognize. So let's come back this way. Thank you, Zach. You're well welcome. done. The guitar, as you as you've seen, has influenced so many musical styles. It comes out of a folk tradition uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, influences country music, blues, of course. But there is a type of music that the guitar actually created, and it wouldn't be here without the guitar, and that's rock and roll. So I want to talk about two of the uh, really the monsters of guitar making, Gibson and Fender, and we'll come back to what gives in here, but the Fender name uh, is uh, obviously uh, absolutely iconic in, in guitar making and in guitars, and what we have here is the first uh, really mass-produced uh, electric guitar, and of course became a complete hit and is still being used today, and this is the Telecaster. Um, radio repairman Leo Fender at the time uh, decided he could improve on this idea of the guitar. It not only uh, really did a lot of improvements on the electrification, but also in the overall design of the guitar. It, this is 1949 when uh, the, the uh, Telecaster is, is invented. He actually wanted it to be called the Broadcaster with his radio background but ran into some uh, legal issues with Gresh, the guitar maker, who already had some broadcaster uh, items. But what we have here is a most unusual guitar design for 1949. And with our eyes, maybe it looks a little older, completely modern in the time. Uh, what, one of the most interesting things is this cutaway, we call that a horn or a cutaway, uh, that is beginning to let the guitarist, the, in, the player, become more expressive by hitting the highest notes on what we would call this fretboard uh, on the neck of the guitar. Um, and of course, some of the, uh, the innovations in electrification, tone and volume together, uh, helping to shape the sound. And mainly, all the parts of the Telecaster are now being made separately. So we're seeing uh, really the, the industrialization of the electric guitar. Uh, Fender's next design uh, would also really go on to eclipse the Telecaster, and that would be the Stratocaster. 
and this is really the the pre the uh, the most renowned design. In fact, if you were to take a silhouette of the of the Stratocaster and just flash it up, most people in the world would recognize what that is, uh, almost uh, very much like the Coca Cola bottle. So this has become iconic. Uh, you can see the additions, three uh, pickups, the tone, the volume are all connected to each pickup, giving the musician so much more flexibility in volume and tone. And an addition of another cutaway at the top. So that allows for the thumb to wrap around and uh, to enable more uh, kind of fluidity with the, the types of notes that are being played. So you can see how rock and roll is beginning to get shaped through these instruments. And as a foil to the Fender Company, we cannot forget the monster company at Gibson. And on the other side, very uh, metaphorically uh, placed, opposite it is the Gibson Les Paul, uh, also one of the most recognized uh, guitars in rock and roll very different type of guitar than the Fender. Uh, whereas the Fender is a flat, completely flat top, the Les Paul is actually, has a, a kind of a, an arch shape, not unlike some of the early blues guitars um, uh, surface. However, this is not a hollow guitar. It's completely solid and that actually makes it a heavier guitar, much heavier than the Stratocaster. In the 60s, uh, many British rock bands started taking on the Les Paul, which uh, incidentally is, is named for Les Paul, but the guitarist Les Paul never really designed this in any way, shape, or form. He didn't contribute a thing to it except the name. Not a lot of people know that. So an amazing moment uh, where really the birth of rock and roll happens. And taking a cue from the 1960s, I'd like you to walk with me to a part of the exhibition that we sell curated. Uh, and this really is a, a little bit of local flair and history that is phenomenal. In 1962, uh, a couple of people got married, Jerry and Marianne and Milan, and began thinking about making a recording studio in South Peak in Illinois, which they did by 1964. Jerry and Mary Ann had built their own recording studio. What happens after that is absolute history. Uh, and, and for our region, uh, we will see here in a minute how much they have influenced music in our region and music in rock and roll overall. With us, we have Mary Ann and Jerry Marlon. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, I want to ask you a couple things. We're standing in front of a ton of records. Every one of these records recorded at Golden Voice Recording Company. Tell us a little bit about, uh, if you can, uh, as with a long storied uh, history of Golden Voice, why you did it, and some of the most important people who recorded with you. Sure. <clears throat> well, we got into the uh, studio idea uh, from a fellow employee named Blaine Goss. And Blaine used to be the manager of an Arthur Murray dance studio here in Peoria. And he was uh, Richard Pryor's first manager, or at least the first booking agent. And I met Blaine, and Blaine had a small recording studio on his desk in his office. And I got inspired by that. I went home one evening and I told Mary, I said, you know, let's put one of those in our downstairs of our house. So we put a little studio in. We experimented for a while, had bands come in from all over. And I told Mary, I said, you know, I think this thing can be a, a viable business. So we went on to find land and we built in South Pekin because I couldn't find an appropriate building. So we went to South Peak and the mayor of the town uh, gave us an acre of property for a very, uh, very inexpensive price. And we put up our own building. I did a lot of the construction myself. And from that point on, 
we grew slowly, and it was really a, a low-budget operation for a while. But the band started coming from all over, and it worked out very well. And uh, at the time, you know, you never know who you're going to record, and who's going to walk in the door, it's going to become famous. So you don't look at it like you're developing any fame. You're just doing day-to-day -day business, that just trying to make a living at it, at least on our part. But a number of people that came there and a number of groups did quite well. And I developed a lot of connections with record companies like RCA and things. So they invited me to send tapes out to them when I would get a, a person like Dan Fogelberg or Jonathan Kane from Journey. Those kind of people were producing really good stuff. And so I would send their tapes out or I would take the tapes to Chicago. And I developed a lot of interest in those people there on it just developed and grew and grew. Unbelievable. And and you mentioned Dan Fogelberg, you mentioned Jonathan Kane of Journey, both of whom recorded with you when they were teenagers, right. which is a, a story that is not uncommon with Golden Voice. There were others, right? Yes, and, and most of the musicians were very young. We were very young. You know, I was in my early 20s, and, and uh, so most of the musicians that came there were inexperienced, they were mostly just stage players, so we all kind of developed the whole routine together. A lot of experimentation, a lot of trial and error, and uh, the, the, the companies that heard the talent, they could hear the talent, whether we produced the best product or not wasn't the point. It developed a lot of interest, and uh, that whole thing just slowly grew and grew, and, and really turned out well for a lot of people in Jerry, it's just a phenomenal story. It's a point of pride for our region. We're so happy. The museum is completely thrilled to have been able to feature this. But I do want to mention, if you miss the exhibition and you somehow miss these platinum records, the gold records that Jerry and Marianne contributed to, we are going to be working with this collection in the future. So make sure, uh, if you didn't get down here to see the story, uh, we're going to be uh, examining this closer uh, as, as the museum uh, moves into the future. So thank you for, for, pay, for being with us for this story. And now I will introduce John Morris again. I have one more guitar before we're going to turn it over, Bill. I want you to tell us about it. This is the last <laughs> bit. Come over here with Bill Conner. And before we get to the last part, this is one of the craziest guitars we have in the entire exhibition. Bill, give us one last guitar. Well, as you can see, the, the iconic shape of the guitar, which it actually comes from a smaller ukulele uh, type uh, design, uh, which is completely recognizable now. If you look down here, and you will see that this shape actually comes from one of the first animals that the instrument was created from. So you can see this little aardvark shell, which really inspires and, and makes perfect armadillo. sense. Or armadillo. Uh, makes perfect sense for the playability of the instrument. So it's another point uh, of mentioning how the, the kind of evolution of this instrument has been expressive as well as the people who play it. Unbelievable. So before we say goodbye to Bill, I want to say on behalf of uh, everybody who values what the museum does, Bill Conger and his entire curatorial team and all the staff for the Pure Roof Museum have done a magnificent job. So if you were able to be with us in person, you can help me applaud Bill and all of our staff. But Bill is a guitarist himself, so is Zach. It's been a really special privilege more to come for the performing arts uh, from the Pure River Front Museum. So thank you, Bill Conger, very much. So, so let's come over here for one grand finale before we uh, leave this great exhibition uh, for good. We've got one special surprise. First, I want to introduce another colleague of ours, Joe Elwood. Joe is our store manager and patron services manager here. And we've had a really cool contest, contest or opportunity going on Joe, tell us a little bit about that. Right, John. So we have had a raffle, and we had um, some of our special members of the museum, some visionary society members, 
that generously donated a Gibson guitar. And I think for me personally, um, one of the best things was just having patrons come into the museum and say, where's the guitar? Where's the, the guitar for the raffle? And how can I enter? And people were so excited about that. And so they would always ask, when is it um, going to be given away? And when is the drawing? And that day is today. So um, I know that everyone is very excited about this. I'm very excited to see um, who the winner is going to be. And of our 1,071 entrants, for the time that the exhibit was open, which was just under seven weeks. I think those numbers are fabulous, but without further ado. Thank you. So let me introduce you to the patrons who made this possible. Come on over here with the cameras so and we get a good look at two important things. The Gibson Flying V guitar, which has been generously donated. This is a brand new Gibson Flying V. Uh, I think it was a $1,500 value, it's an incredible guitar. And meet the other important part of this equation, uh, the dynamic duo, Greg and Karen Geronis. And I'm standing back far enough from them and they're married to each other, so I'm gonna let them unmask so we can see what they look like uh, as uh, we, we pull this drawing and then I'll come back to me after, but I'm gonna let you guys pull the drawing and announce the winner, the Flying V guitar. Greg Geronis, a member of the Board of Trustees here at the museum. Hello, I'm Gregory Geronis, and this is my lovely wife, Karen Geronis. I'm proud to be in my fourth year as a trustee of the Curia Riverfront Museum, member of the Board of Directors. And my wife, Karen, is going to pull the lucky winner for what I perceive to be one of the coolest pieces of playable and functional art you could ever own in your life. Karen? And the lucky winner is Ashley Burquist of Washington, Illinois. Congratulations, Ashley. That is fantastic. Ashley, congratulations. Thanks to Greg and Karen Geronis. Uh, and on behalf of the board, of the museum, and the staff, and 4,000 plus members in our visionary society, the Milans are with us today. We're so grateful for all you did. I want to mention one more time, uh, Katie McCord Jenkins at Illinois Mutual, who was the lead uh, first in sponsor to help us get this PNC, OSF, and Unity Point, our corporate visionary society council, members of the Ruby K. Warner Trust, the Illinois Arts Council, many others, and the members of the visionary society, without whom this exhibition would not have been possible. Let's, Hannah, follow me. We'll take one last look at guitar, the instrument that rocked the world. And come over here, Joe Corey. This is Dr. Joe Corey. At two o'clock, in just a few minutes, Dr. Corey, uh, himself uh, an esteemed member of our medical community here, but a superb uh, guitarist, and he'll be bringing his talents to the stage beautifully, finishing up. He opened the live performance some 14 weeks ago on, on the members opening of this exhibition and he will be closing today. So uh, stay tuned at two o'clock, Dr. Corey on the guitar. So thank you thank for that. By the way, before we, before we uh, get one final look at this, what is your uh, passion for the guitar? Why do you play? And, uh, if, you were to, if somebody were to ask, some young child would ask, why would I want to play the guitar? What's, what's special about the guitar for you? Well, it's, it's a great way to produce music, first of all. Music is a gift from God to us, and I, fortunately I feel I've been given a gift, and I like to be able to, to express myself uh, uh, through the guitar and my voice. I'm, I'm an okay guitarist. And a vocalist I, I, as well. But I sing. I say my singing is my lead instrument, not my guitar player. <laughs> Well, but it's uh, it's a relatively easy instrument to pick up, and it's much easier to carry around than a piano. It is much easier to carry around than a piano. More guitars sold this year during our pandemic year 
than ever before in American history, and more guitars sold than all other musical instruments combined. It's something I did not know. It's fascinating. It's a very individualized, individualistic instrument, as you say. So stay tuned, 2 o'clock. Dr. Joe Corey with us. And Hannah, let's come through one last look at guitar instrument that rocked the world. Just walk with me as we take one final look across this beautiful gallery, the work of our curators, H.P. Newquist from New York and the National Museum of the Guitar. And we'll follow in one, one final look here at this beautiful uh, exhibition. Coming up in March, we will be opening an exhibition of the permanent collection here at the museum that will be our spring exhibition with all hopes that we'll be able to open this building again. Uh, and then this summer, T-Rex, the ultimate predator, we will be the international debut of the tour of T-Rex, the ultimate predator, organized by our friends at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. First time ever, Peoria, Illinois will be launching an international tour of a major traveling exhibition, opening a Memorial Day weekend. So lots going on at the Peoria Riverfront Museum, but most importantly is our gratitude for you, the members, the visionary society members of the Peoria Riverfront Museum. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. Thank you for doing all you do for us. Be inspired. God bless.